Our uh, scripture reading for today is found in the book of Titus, chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. Allow me to read to you. Remind the people to be subject to ru rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously through Christ Jesus our Savior so that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law, because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. As soon as I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, because I have decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenas the lawyer and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to, do, to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in, in the faith. Grace be with you all. May we now call on Pastor Nikki to share with us God's message. Good morning to everyone. Good morning, a wonderful morning. I am so delighted to see our dear Pastor Billy. You know, hello. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> a wonderful time. Uh, for the past few weeks, I assume because I have not been here, <laughs> we have been going through a series on the book of Titus. I simply want to relate that to uh, our previous book series on Nehemiah. If you recall, when we were going through Nehemiah, we ferreted out a number of leadership issues. I mean, the book of Nehemiah, if there's something that is outstanding in the book of Nehemiah, uh, that would be leadership, right? And, and, and we have drawn out a number of practical principles not only for our personal lives but also for our church for our community well i love the i love the fact that titus also speaks about leadership doesn't it and i hope that the previous speakers have uh, dealt with this again it's a uh, it's something that we need to hear again and again. Uh, let me begin by sharing with you that the quality, the quality of our churches, the growth and the health of the church is greatly dependent on the quality of its leaders. And this is what the book is all about. Titus is a, uh, I would say, a manual, a letter that educates a leader on how to govern the church. In fact, we would often use this book in teaching pastors, in teaching leaders 
about what it means to pastor a church. Let me share with you some background about this book. The Apostle Paul wrote, of course, this epistle to Titus, a trusted spiritual son, a faithful worker. Titus was a Gentile believer. Understand that, that he has both Jews and Gentile co-workers. Titus was a Gentile believer. And he was entrusted with oversight of the church in the island of Crete. Why did the Apostle Paul write this letter? Well, when Paul left Titus in Crete, he entrusted him with a crucial responsibility of completing the work that he has left unfinished. Let's read that. This uh, purpose is clearly delineated in Titus chapter 1, verse 5. May I invite you to read this aloud. Titus 1, verse 5, all together. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you just to uh, make you visualize the setup of the church in Crete, most probably the church was made up of house churches. And these house churches were, were situated all over, all over the island of Crete. Crete was a, was a fairly large island. And the various, uh, the various uh, communities, the various believers would congregate in homes. Understand that there were no church buildings yet during this time. You know, So you have a lot of home, what we may call a cell groups, that make up one church. And the Apostle Paul was instrumental in planting this church. However, the church, the church planting program was not yet completed. As, as we see here, uh, they ha they, Titus had to complete the work that was left unfinished. I would often tell church planters, when do you know? When do you know that the church has been planted? When do you know that the church has been fully established? Huh? In other words, what was undone? What was not completed yet? Well, the passage also answers that, right? He says here, appoint elders in every town. And I think Pastor Keith, in one of his messages, I'm viewing the messages, the previous messages. In one of his messages, he stressed the fact that elders are pastors. Pastors are elders. They're also called by another term, overseers. These are three terms that describe one office. I, I know, I know that, uh, you know, in our context today, in some churches, a bishop or a pastor or an elder are all distinct. But in biblical times, these are simply different terms that refer to one office. And there was a great need, there was a great need for the church in Crete to have elders, shepherding, shepherding leaders to shepherd the church. That was left undone. And then, if you have your Bibles, take a peek. Take a peek at, uh, at verse 6. What's next? What's next? Well, from that point on, you see the qualifications laid out, right? The qualifications of leaders. In other words, it was crucial for Titus. The reason why Titus was left in Crete 
was so that he may develop some people, key people, to be leaders, to be elders of the church who would shepherd the various communities that make up this one church. One of the key tasks of Timothy was to appoint over overseers and elders in every town who could provide leadership for the newly formed churches. And this was to ensure that each group had godly leaders who could shepherd the congregation, teach sound doctrine. By the way, that's one of the tasks of elders. Uh, they're not just policy makers. Elders are teachers. They feed the flock. You know? They needed godly leaders who would guide the church towards spiritual maturity. Now, this is even more emphasized in the island of Crete. Huh? The island of Crete was notorious, I would say notorious in terms of its culture and it needed strong godly leaders who could guide the churches towards spiritual maturity notice titus chapter 1 verse 12 to 13 huh? and and i i want us to read this uh, really looking between the lines here uh, what is paul saying about the culture of crete Altogether, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Ah, this testimony is true. Therefore, what is Titus, what does Titus have to do as a pastor? Huh? He must rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith. So let me ask you, what was Crete known for? Huh? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Your own culture being known for this? In fact, in fact, uh, uh, when you want to, when, when you want to, Tell a person that he was lazy and that he was a liar. You know, another term for this is Cretan. Cretan. In other words, it was endemic in their culture. They were deceivers. They were lazy. They were evil. Huh? Uh, very much like another culture. Corinth. Corinth. Remember Corinth? For those of you who have been reading your Bibles, you know, if you read Corinth, you know that uh, 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 there, there were a number of sins that were endemic in that culture. And if you would want to call a person immoral, huh? immoral, this is a derogatory term, you would call him a Corinthian. Corinthian katalaga. Corinthian. <laughs> that, was, that was kind of a curse. You know? And likewise, Cret Cretans were like that. Cretan. You're a Cretan. Oh. Uh, you know, that, was, that was an insult for them. Now, think of it this way. Think of it this way. There are sins that are endemic in various cultures, right? What is endemic in our culture? We kind of, you know, we kind of snicker at the Cretans. Ah, Cretans are known for their deceit, their lying, their evil, their lazy, their laziness. You know, we, we snicker at that. But how about this? How about us? We're not that holy, are we? You know, many sins are endemic also in our own culture. I, I recall a time, you know, when my lolo, when my granddad, granddad would repeat a word. 
oftentimes to us you know so that we would be true to our words he would say it in Spanish my granddad would say palabra de honor palabra de honor there was a time when Filipinos would value the word their word right some of you are nodding and you have gray hair <laughs> you know what I'm saying right but nowadays nowadays that seems to be lost and lying also believe it or not is endemic in our culture among other sins as well right such is the power of sin in the lives of people not only of individuals but as a culture now going back to crete this is what titus had to face with huh? and he was supposed to build up leaders for the church in crete why is that because leaders are supposed to teach the word and live out live out the kind of life that is countercultural that goes against the trend of the world we are supposed to live out scripture does this make sense to us that's what leaders are all about and so he had this tall order of building up leaders for the church uh, another passage of scripture just for us to understand the culture in crete uh, the uh, the crete the island of crete had a lot of false teachers roaming about some of these were from the pagan what was from the pagan side others were from the jewish side but all of them were false teachers now what was what what were they teaching huh? what were they teaching the apostle paul says this there are many who are what insubordinate in other words rebellious people empty talkers deceivers once again deceivers liars in other words these false teachers were aggravating the sin sin lying was already endemic in their culture and here the false teachers were adding fuel to the fire especially he says those of the circumcision party false teachers coming from the Jewish religion verse 11 what is Titus tasked to do as a leader? Huh? What is Titus tasked to do? They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Whew, tall order. I could just imagine some of the members of the church in Crete you know telling telling Titus Titus don't say that don't preach that don't go against the culture it's offensive right imagine if Titus would do that huh the thing about Christianity Christianity does not accommodate culture right but it transforms cultures that's what Christianity does you know and we are called to proclaim the word even if it goes against culture I don't care if you're Filipino or Chinese don't give me that are you Christian do you follow the word your leaders are tasked to preach the word and to insist on it again and again and again 
spiritual godly leaders were crucial. Paul's directive to Titus highlights the importance of having godly leadership in place to ensure that the church would be well fed with sound doctrine and established in a life of holiness. Because the two go hand in hand. Doctrine, living. Belief, behavior. Receive the right doctrine, chances are you live righteously. Right? And that is what the leadership is tasked to do. Now in this chapter, well, let me, let me share with you a quote coming from a book that I have been meditating upon. You know, I have read this several times. It's a book by Mark Dever called Nine Marks. Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. And among the marks that he mentions that was crucial to the church is that of godly leadership. And this is what he had to say. Huh? He says this, all together, Faithful leadership ensures that the church remains true to the gospel and that the lives of members reflect gospel-centered living. And I say a resounding amen to that. Paul exhorts Timothy now in this chapter to teach how believers ought to live in a way that reflects the gospel. In other words, this is what spiritual leaders have to teach. This is what spiritual leaders ought to demonstrate in their lives. Now let's go to the text. The first, that was simply my introduction. You know, we'll be finished by 2 o'clock. No, don't worry. You know, uh, he first deals with the command to godly and productive living. You know, chapter 3. Notice verse 1. He says here, Remind them, Titus, as a spiritual leader, remind them, the people, to be what? To be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Remind them. What does that imply? It implies that they know it already. They know it already. But it helps if you constantly remind them of that. Huh? In fact, the term remind uh, in this passage was written in the present tense in the Greek. In other words, when it's written in the present tense, the implication is constantly stress this. Constantly tell them about this. Huh? It implies a continuous action. Again and again and again. Why is that? Because you're going against culture. You're going against something that is endemic. Not only in their personal lives, but in their community. Some, some things have to be stressed again and again. And in this case, we have to remind ourselves again and again, Hey, we're believers. We're not to live in accordance to our culture. But if culture goes against Scripture, we uphold Scripture and remind them again and again. The Apostle Peter elaborates this command even more. We read in 1 Peter chapter 2, just, just so that we would understand that Titus chapter 3 verse 1 is not an isolated text. But we see this all throughout Scripture. And Peter tells us, be subject for the Lord's sake to what? To every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish 
those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Stop there for a while. In other words, you know, in other words, human leaders, human institutions are established ultimately by God. And our rebellion against the institution that he himself has established is going against God. How strong are these words? The gospel, I want to stress this, the gospel has practical implications. It's not just a message that we preach, come to Jesus Christ and receive eternal life. But frankly, it does not have any implications in your life now. No, that's not the gospel. The gospel is transformative. If Christ is in your life, He changes us. He changes our mindset. He changes our ways, our behavior. He changes our speech. That's what the gospel does. Verse 15, we read there, It is the will of God. I mean, how clear can you get? You want to know what the will of God is? Not mysterious. Here it is. This is the will of God. That by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. In other words, there are many people who try to criticize us Christians. They're just looking. They're just dying for a loophole. They want to see some loophole in your life, right? Peter is saying, don't give them that. Silence the critics. Silence the ignorant talk of people. Those who accuse us by living righteously. Live as people who are free. Yes, in other words, we are freed by Christ from sin. And so we ought to live as free people, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Some Christians or so-called Christians rationalize, hey, I'm free in Christ. Diba? I'm free in Christ. Therefore, I can do what I want, which is to sin. Not realizing that we have been freed from sin. And our freedom is to glorify God. Not to live in sin. Not to live as you please. So don't use your, your freedom as a cover-up for evil. But live as servants of God. And then he says, honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Honor the emperor. Quite interestingly, the emperor during that time was Nero. I don't know if you know your history, but Nero wasn't that good a king. Not only did Christians hate him, <laughs> Because he, he initiated a wave of persecution against, against uh, Christians. But he wasn't even loved by his own people. That's how terrible a king he was. Huh? Now, having heard this divine command uh, uh, given by the Apostle Paul and given by the Apostle Peter, what does this look like? Let me just break it down into more specific terms. Firstly, this is what it means. Believers are called to respect and obey governing authorities as an expression of their submission to God. Ultimately, we are called to submit to the Lord. And our submission to the Lord is seen in our submission to the laws of the land. Let me make it simple. Huh? Let me make it 
quite simple. Red means stop. <laughs> Green means go. How simple can you get? There's a regulation, obey it. Right? Simple things. Do not litter. Hmm? The lines that you see on the road, remember that? You know, they're for pedestrians. I mean, our system, notice here, our system is a reflection of our culture. As believers, what do we demonstrate? What do we show to other people? Honestly, what do we show to other people? Huh? When we were crossing the street, headed towards a church, you know, we were walking in those lines. <laughs> As good citizens, you know, we followed the rules, and a tricycle just went passing by. And I was with my wife, and, and my daughter who were going to church, we were, all, we were already late that time, you know, we wanted to go to church. And here was a tricycle just whoosh, passing right in front of us. And, 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 and I, 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 I must admit, I shouted a bit. I didn't curse, I didn't curse, but I said, Oi! I, I just said that, you know, uh, just, just, just for, for that tricycle driver to understand that I was disgusted by his actions. That was wrong. And he kind of looked at me at the back, you know, he kind of looked at me with a strange look. As if saying, what's the fuss? When the culture says what's wrong is right and what's right is wrong beloved sad to say you're at the bottom of the of the barrel as far as morality is concerned that is our culture today believers are called to respect and obey governing authorities as their expression of their submission to God. Of course, we would argue, well, does it mean that we have to obey everything that the government tells us, especially if I don't like the government? Of course not. You know, uh, if such laws contradict God's command, oh, certainly. You know, Acts chapter 5, verse 29, takes into effect. Wherein we read the passage, we'd rather, we must obey God rather than man. However, in general, Christians are to live peaceably under govern, governmental rule, demonstrating respect and submission, even if you are not in agreement with the government. Secondly, Secondly, believers are called to be what? Peacemakers. Right? I hope, I hope as Christians, we are not known to be meddlesome, to be troublemakers. Huh? Of course, Romans chapter 12 comes to mind. He says in verse 17 to 19, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, notice this, in other words, there are cases, there are cases wherein, you know, we must stand, stand our ground and obey what we are convinced to be God's will, God's principles, you know. There are times like that. But if it is possible, so far as it depends upon you, what? Live peaceably with all. 
we continue beloved never avenge yourselves but leave it to the wrath of God for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay says the Lord our response to injustice conflicts should reflect Christ's call to love and forgiveness address conflicts and grievances through peaceful and constructive means we should always reflect Christ's love in our own interactions our behavior should be a reflection of our faith serving as witnesses to others you see there's a higher issue more, more than just insisting on what we think we deserve in life there's a higher issue and the higher issue is our witness people are you concerned about that is that a priority concern of UCCC people I'm a Christian and I must care for my witness as a Christian that's the higher issue our behavior should be a reflection of our faith serving as a witness to others and also thirdly another meaning of that command is this believers are called to be productive members of society and I wrote down uh, that uh, that phrase that clause you know which says be ready for every good work that's the command of Paul to Titus be teach them this be ready for every good work this is a call for Christians to live in a way that contributes positively to, to the society around them the command to submit is goes beyond mere obedience to the law or it goes beyond sim simply uh, obedience to social norms it points to an active purposeful engagement in doing good that reflects the character and the grace of God part of being ready to do good works is a readiness to help others who are in need you see we are called to be charitable people charity of course begins at home right so in the body of Christ we extend charity to one another yet we are also called to be charitable to our neighbors whether they be Christians or otherwise right we have a responsibility to our brethren but we have also a responsibility to society people don't be Christian hermits some some Christians they have this mindset well we ought to be separate from the world and true enough there is a sense in which we should not adopt the moral standards of the world amen there you go thank you Kai <laughs> uh, uh, we are not called to do that but nonetheless we are people who still live in the world and through our actions we ought to attract people non-believers to Jesus Christ by living righteous lives let's be productive let's benefit society someone someone had asked someone had asked if your church is taken away from your place right now would the community notice I like that question you know 
there's a church there's, there's, there's a church in a particular community and somehow that church is decided has decided to transfer with the church with the community notice ah may church palaron di ko alam For, for many of us, the church, the, the community would not even notice that the church has transferred or that, ch that the church is gone. Let's benefit society because that is part of our being a witness. Believers are called to be productive members of society. Now, not only are we called to submit to the government but we are also called to show holy conduct towards all men in other words this is the non-believing world what's our responsibility towards them read this please read this aloud to speak evil of no one to avoid quarreling to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy towards what? All people. See that? Once again, this is the will of God. This is part and parcel of communicating the gospel to society. The Christian speech and actions should be marked by kindness humility and peace this is particularly challenging in a hostile world but essential for our witness to the gospel of the gospel again we are people going against the tide this is the society we live in are we gonna go with the flow let me ask you are we going to go with the flow? Or should we live counter-cultural? Because God has called us to live a distinct kind of life. In what ways can we practice gentleness and respect in our daily interactions, especially with those who oppose us? Again, this is the moral principle of our Master, Jesus Christ. Let me remind us of that. Secondly, we're now in verse 3, kind of inching our way to the end. The means and motivation for godly and productive living. I, I, I love this because the Apostle Paul doesn't only tell us what to do. Huh? But he always gives us a rationale for that. And here we see the means and the motivation. He goes right to our former state. In other words, this is life BC. Remember that, uh, that term BC, before Christ? This is our life before we met Jesus Christ. I hope this too describes our life previously, not presently. Okay? Let's read that. For we ourselves were what? We're once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy hated by other people by others and hating one another that's the kind of life that we live before we met jesus christ right we, we were characterized by sin we were dominated by uh, the ways of the world we followed the ways of the world now let me ask you, how does this motivate us to live godly lives, to live productive lives? Well, for one, remembering our past helps us 
to have compassion on those who are lost. When we recall our own condition before Christ, we can more deeply empathize with those who are still living apart from Him. You see, it's not about us being better than others. So, some people think that way. You know, uh, yucky people. You know, I, I, I don't want to have anything to do with them. So we tend to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world because we think we're better than they, than they are. Right? But it's not about us being better. It's about offering the same grace that we have received. We are what we are because of the grace of God. Secondly, notice here, remembering our past lives, remembering the kind of garbage life that we were saved from, huh? remembering that causes us to be humble, to have humility in sharing the gospel. It reminds us that we are not saved because of anything inherently good about us. Let me ask you, why were you saved? Why were you saved? Uh, because at one time I showed myself to be a good person. Huh? Uh, 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 because I gave such and such amount of money to the church. No. No. We are saved simply by His mercy and grace, aren't we? Remember that. And this causes us to approach other people with much humility. Not only are we to look back at our former state, but we are to look back at how we were saved. Let me remind you of this. Huh? I hope, I hope this is how you were saved. Hmm? Let me bring to mind the way we were saved. Notice this, verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he's talking about when Christ came into the world in order to die for our sins. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness but according to His own mercy. Why were you saved? Let me ask you that. Why were you saved? Don't point to yourself. The answer lies with God. Because God looked upon us with mercy. You see, the time when we say, well, I, that's wrong. That's wrong. Because you are not saved because of anything in you. I mean, how clear can you get? I even underlined that. If you're going to share the gospel, and I hope and pray that you share the gospel, stress this. Why did God send Jesus Christ to die on the cross? Not because of us. Not because of anything we have done. Ah, kasi, you know, we're, we're so a delightful people. We're, we're good people. We're pretty people. No, no, nothing of us. Not because of any merit on our part. He stresses that. But what? But because of what? By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Notice, it doesn't mention you. It doesn't mention anything that you have done or you have achieved in life. Nothing. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. 
whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by God the Father's grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. In other words, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Trinity have done the work God the Father bestowed grace. He sent His Son Jesus Christ to die. And the Holy Spirit applies that work that Christ has done on the cross to us. And so we believe. Are you with me? Nothing in us. Salvation is entirely the work of God's grace. Accomplished through the regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you, what's regeneration? I don't know what it says in your version. Another version says new birth. Huh? Renewal by the new birth. Regeneration, if we would define it, is the work of the Holy Spirit whereby He sovereignly makes alive. Those who are dead. Here's a question I'd like to ask you. How do you raise a person back to life? Hmm? Hmm? Can you do it? Okay. Good answer, Kai. You know, good answer. It, it, we cannot do this, nor can the, can the dead person do anything. Please make me alive. Nothing from the dead person. Why? Because he's dead. Make sense? And so, if that dead person should be made alive, what should happen? A sovereign act of the Spirit. A miraculous act has to be done by God in order to bring life. To that lifeless person. Make sense? That is regeneration. Another term for that is new birth. Still another term for that is being born again. Being born again is a sovereign act of God. Let me read to you another passage. A passage that I suppose you know by heart. Because many times we have covered this passage, right? He begins by saying, you were dead. There you go. Once again, he brings us back to our past life. Before Jesus Christ. You were dead in, our transgre in your transgressions and sin. Now let's jump to verse 4. What does he say? But God, not us, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which He loved us. Now, here's, here's something that's crucial. Verse 5. Verse 5. Read that aloud. What does it say? But even, uh, even when we were dead in our trespasses. Oh, stop there. When did He make us alive? Of course, no brainer, when we were dead. In other words, since a dead person cannot participate in his own resurrection, so we cannot participate in our own regeneration. This is mercy coming from God. Make sense? And Paul reminds us of that in Ephesians. Even when we were dead in trespasses, our trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ. And so he reiterates, by grace we have been saved. Do I hear an amen to that? That's the motivation for what? 
for living godly and productive lives. Because Christ has been compassionate towards us. And He has bestowed us grace upon grace. And this new life in Christ is the foundation for godly living. God grants us the capacity to live for the glory of God. Once again, may I ask you, does this reach your heart? Do you understand what's being said? Let's go to the third, because this is something I'd like to stress, okay? Uh, the foundation for godly and productive living. Let me start this section by saying this. In view of this, in view of what has been said, uh, as a pastor, if I were the pastor of this church, or as a leader of the church, how are we going to motivate people to do good works? Are you listening? How should pastors motivate their people to do good works? Ah, do this, pastor. Pound on good works again and again. Do good, do good, do good. And so a lot of pastors do that. They stress the good works. But I beg to disagree. Paul, the Apostle Paul, while good works are good, uh, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't stress it in that way. As if, as if good works come from our own energy. Mm, uh, mm, I'm going to go do good works. Mm, mm, it, you know, it doesn't, we cannot generate that on our own. And so, he says this. Listen to this. The saying is trustworthy. And I want you to what? To stress. I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These Things are excellent and profitable for people. We, we see that passage and we think what the Apostle Paul is telling us is to say, to charge people, do good, do good, do good. No, that's not the thing that is trustworthy. That's not the thing that we have to insist on. What we have to insist on is the previous statement. And what's the previous statement about? The gospel. The gospel. That we are saved not through our own good works. Are you listening? But through the mercy and the goodness of God. This, Paul says, is trustworthy. And I want you, here's another way of putting it, leaders of the church, Leaders of UCCC, he says this, I want you to insist on this. It's something that we have to remind people again and again to persistently teach and uphold these things. In other words, what he's saying is that the gospel has practical implications to life. If one is truly saved, he will live a transformed and productive life. We often think of the gospel as beneficial for the afterlife. I mean, is that all the gospel is beneficial? You know, for the afterlife? No, the gospel is beneficial now. It changes lives now. You want God's people to be productive? Don't just pound on good works. Remind them again and again of how they were saved. Through the mercy, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The compassion of God. 
friends, in what practical ways can we devote ourselves to good works? If we are truly saved, how do we demonstrate that to society? Secondly, the Apostle Paul tells us for us to be productive believers, uh, for us to generate good works in our lives, not only do we have to remind them of the gospel message again and again, but to avoid certain things that distract us, that sap the life out of believers. And what are we to avoid? Let me ask you, what are we to avoid? Avoid false teachings. That, in essence, is what Paul is telling us here. You see, false teaching, false teaching, teaches us to depend upon ourselves. False teaching tells us the answer lies within us. Us. We can do it, right? Just do it. Remember that motto? E, us, us. We generate the energy, the power to do good works. No! Christians, how are we to live transformed lives? By immersing ourselves in the gospel. In what God has done for us. Again, does this get you? Uh, does this grab you by the collar? It's important that we stress this. Avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are what? Unprofitable. They sap the life out of the church. Avoid those things that draw us away from the centrality of the gospel. As for a person who steers up division because false teaching divides, false teachings cause division, he says, after warning him once, at most twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such person is warped and sinful and he is condemned. If there's a person here continuously teaching about the answer lies with him. We are saved through our own merits. We, we generate good works through our own energy. Have nothing to do with them. Believers are warned against engaging in divisive and unproductive debates that detract us from the mission of the church. Persistent divisiveness is to be dealt with decisively to maintain the unity and preserve the purity of the church. Lastly, we're about to be done. You know, hold on to your horses. Are you still awake? Okay. Here are some immediate applications to Paul's plea for believers to focus on doing good. Huh? Uh, this is the application. He goes to some personal instructions to Titus. Paul was a missionary here. Now, he, was, he, he left Titus for a while in order to troubleshoot, in order to deal with the problems there, while he goes on to another place of ministry. And then he tells them this, When I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, these are still apostolic representatives, huh? I want you do your best to come to me to Nicopolis. Paul was in Nicopolis at this time. And he says here, I have decided to winter here. That's another way of saying, Titus, come to me. 
I want to have fellowship with you. You see, missionaries also need fellowship. It can be a lonely task. Being on your own, proclaiming the gospel, right? For those of you who are in missions, you know that, you know. And so Titus, by attending to the needs of the Apostle Paul, was doing something beneficial to him. That's good work. Amen? And that's part of it. How can we do good? How? By attending to the needs of those who labor for the spread of the gospel. He continues on. Do your best to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. People who are unknown to us, they're not major characters of the Bible, but actually they are faithful servants of the Lord. They too went about proclaiming the gospel. And Zenos and Apollos, you know, passed through Crete so that what? So that they would benefit from the church. Speak them. What does that mean? Huh? Oh, what does that mean? Speak them. Is, is, is that what it means? Huh? Kick them in the behind. No. Uh, it, it means Paul was asking Titus to tell the church to help Zenos and Apollos who were traveling for ministry purposes. Speed them on their way. Help them out. Assist them. Let our people, read that please, let our people learn to devote themselves to do good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not to be unfruitful. Good works before non-believers or towards non-believers. But here, good works towards believers, right? People, Christians, we ought to be known for our good works. Why is that? Because we were saved for that very purpose. Not saved by good works, no. But saved for good works. And then he ends with a final greeting. Read this with me. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. And we're done, right? Well, let me add one more thing. Because we tend to ignore this. This is just a greeting. But I'd like to stress the fact that love is the impetus uh, for doing good works. Right? Paul says, greet those who love us. In other words, greet those who who are doing good towards us. And their good deeds are a, are, are a reflection of their love for the Apostle Paul. How does your behavior as, as a citizen reflect your commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are we living godly lives before society? Are we living productive lives? Manifesting the transformation that God has done in our lives. Secondly, in what ways can we, can reflecting on your own conversion experience motivate you to live more godly? Have you been saved? Amen, Kai. Can you look back and kind of tell yourself, oh, I was a wretched sinner. Worthless. Evil. Liar. But God has transformed me. Amen? Can we say that? I'm not perfect yet, but somehow... The glory of Jesus Christ is 
slowly being manifested in my life. And because of this, I'd like to share this with other people as well. Amen? Finally, what are some specific good works you can engage in that would serve others and glorify God? So I hope you can take this home and reflect upon this. Would you please bow down your heads? These are points to reflect on as we prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper. You have reminded us, O oh God, of our lives before we met Jesus Christ. We were headed for hell. We were headed for condemnation. And our lives, Lord, were not pleasing lives. Lives that were worthless. And yet, by your mercy at some point in our lives, Lord, you awakened our spirits and granted us the grace of new birth. Thank you. We are eternally grateful for this, Lord. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for the forgiveness of all of our sins. Thank you that all these come from you. And it does not have anything to do with us. May your working in our lives, Lord, motivate us to live for the glory of Jesus Christ. Make us more godly more Christ-like? Most especially, Lord, in terms of being productive in life. Teach us, Lord, to be people of good works. Not because we are saved by our good works, but we are saved for good works. Thank you. And at this time, Lord, as we're about to observe the Lord's table, remind us of when Jesus Christ in His goodness and mercy appeared, was sent down to earth to live, to suffer, and die for the sins of his people. Thank you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.